Hello and welcome, friends. Today we have a special talk on statistics for neurosurgeons. This is a very off-beat topic, but very, very, very important for every neurosurgeon who is involved in research. We are so pleased to have you here, Professor Sharma. On behalf of the Education Committee and Professor Yoko Kato, I welcome both the speakers. And Professor Sharma, you may please start your lecture now. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Uh, first, I'd like to thank Professor Yoko Kato, President of the ACNS, and Chair and members of the Educational Committee of the ACNS for giving me this opportunity to share with you all what I have been very passionate about recently. With the exponential rise in the number of research and publication over the recent decades, it is imperative for all of us to be well versed in the basics of medical statistics. Hence, I believe this topic uh, will be of some relevance to the audience here. Okay, Nepal is a small country sandwiched between India and uh, China. And on behalf of the Japanese neurosurgeons and uh, faculty and residents of the, of the university hospital where I work, I extend warm greetings to all of you here. So uh, with these few introductory slides, I'd like to go to the main presentation. I will start with this quotation, the deepest sin against the human mind is to believe things without evidence. And the best way to get this evidence is by doing proper statistical test of the data you have. In line with this, many mainstream, mainstream neurosurgery journals have also started do publishing papers related to biostatistics bio as exemplified by, by this publication in the rare journal. And they have started publishing one or two articles in every two or three months. And the best way to get this evidence is by doing proper statistical test of the data. So the, this is the objective of my presentation. First is to inspire the young neurosurgeon to develop statistical thinking. And now next is the learning essential concepts of medical statistics needed for proposal writing, paper publication, and critically operating the medical literature, which is so important these days. What I am not going to cover today is how to do statistical analysis. As clinicians, we are not supposed to do the statistical anal analysis, but we need to know how to interpret the result. How we define statistics. This is, this is from the famous undergraduate book of epidemiology by, uh, and by start by GM Blas. It is the science and art of dealing with variation in data through collection, classification, analysis, and interpretation in such a way as to obtain reliable results. This is the definition of statistics. Medical statistics is nothing but the application of statistics in the field of medicine. Let's go to the fundamental principle of statistics. This is what we accept. We accept that there is a chance that we come to the wrong conclusion. Just like we schedule a patient, no matter how beautifully we do the surgery, we can never be certain that the patient will do 100%, will have a 100% positive outcome. Same thing applies in the principle of statistics. Let's go with few basic concepts of defining certain parameters. Population is defined as a group of people who share a common character or binding trait, usually a disease. This is what the target Hello, population is there. Yes, yes. Hello? Am I audible? Hello? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Okay. Dr. Kuti, any problem? No, no. No, okay. So defining the population based is a group of people who share a common character or a binding trait, usually the disease in the context of medical research. Doing research on the entire population is just not possible. So we take a sample, which is nothing but a representative part of that population. This, this picture will beautifully illustrate what target population is, what sampling frame is, what sample is. Target population is population of interest in which the researcher wants to do, generalize the results of the study. For example, if I am interested about the cerebral aneurysm of the of, of the entire population is just not possible. So we take that population. Results of the study. So we take the sampling frame is the accessible part of the population from, which is accessible to me. And from that sampling frame, I will take a sample and I'll do the research. From the research, 
my intention would be to generalize this, uh, the result of that sample back to the target population. Now let's go to data. I like to start with this statement, in God we trust, all others must bring data. If we have a very fantastic idea or some, some interesting conclusion we want to make, we have, it has to be supported by data. Without data, it is very hard to convince other people to follow what you want to say. So that this is the reason why we need to have a good quality of good quantity and quality of data in our hand before we can argue for something. These are four closely related terminology. I like to go through these one by one. Data is nothing but a set of values making the basis of reasoning or calculation. Information is data is defined as when the data has been analyzed in some fashion so that it becomes suitable for making decision ones. So from data, it becomes information to make decision ones. When we become knowledgeable is when we, there is understanding based on extensive experience dealing with information on a subject. Then ultimately we become wise when, when the practical application of a particular knowledge in those circumstances when good may result. I'd like to give the one example of uh, climbing Mount Everest. With this corona crisis, now the, our Mount Everest is deserted, but last year there was a traffic jam there. So if one fine day I have a sudden good idea of climbing the Mount Everest, I would go through these four processes. First, the first data I would like to calculate would be the height of the Mount Everest. That will be the data. Then information will be uh, that data plus other data I will uh, collect regarding Everest climbing. I will become knowledgeable when I will have the one and two plus and understanding based on the advice of the other experienced climber. Then ultimate successful climbing would be my wisdom. So same thing applies in statistics and in managing the patient day to, in, on the day-to-day -day basis. Now let's go to the type and distribution of the data. Data can be discrete or data can be continuous uh, because of the nature of my presentation today, it would be beyond the scope of my uh, presentation to go into the details of types of data. Next important thing is how the data are distributed. This is the fundamental basics of uh, statistics. They can be spread out more towards the left side, more towards the right side, or they can be all jumbled up or it can follow a very smooth pattern where majority of the data will be in the center and the half of the data will be spread on one side and half of the data will be on the other side conforming to a shape called bell. So it is called a bell separate curve. This type of data distribution is called normally distributed data. And the fundamental principle here is we have to dif differentiate whether our data we collect it is normally distributed or not. This is very important. There is one book published called uh, St Medical Statistics Made Easy. I have based the majority of my slides on, from this book. They have described eight core topics in statistics, starting from description, uh, description of the data to analyzing clinical investigations and screening. I will go briefly to touch one by one these topics. So statistics which describe data will be like range, percentages, mean, median, mode, and standard deviation. Range and percent are very easy to define, but they are very commonly used in neurosurgical literature. So very commonly used, but it is worse in robustness. It all it says is maximum value minus minimal value. If I am analyzing the patients with aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage, all I'll be saying was me, the youngest patient was 16 year old, maybe oldest patient was 91 year old. That's all the range says. About the percent, sometimes, you know, if the number of sample is uh, data point is very small, researchers sometimes conceal the true value by saying the percent. If you have a total of five patients and three patients have done well, sometimes people might say 60% of my patients have done well. In those situations, you have to see the actual number to see whether there were enough number of patients operated or uh, taken for research or not. This is the one, one caveat about this, uh, this, this, uh, when somebody describes in person. 
mean. Mean is very commonly used in uh, mainstream journal. More than two thirds of the mainstream journals and proposal have uh, have used mean, so it is very commonly used, and we should be uh, knowing what it means. It is most useful when the data is normally distributed. Again, if the data is not normally distributed, mean is not used. It is nothing but the sum of all the values divided by number of values. But one bad thing about the mean is we have to be careful about the outlier. This one data is extremely far spread, then it, it could skew the mean. In those situations, what they recommend is to use interquartile range. And another danger of using mean is this. Uh, typically, the people make fun of statisticians crossing a river. If the river has a variable depth of one feet, two feet, five feet, eight feet, and if the statistician averages takes the mean and tries to walk the river across, he might be drawn. So this is the disadvantage of mean. One has to be very careful while analyzing the data. Next important thing is median. Median is also fairly commonly used like it is used in more than one third of the uh, mainstream papers. It is used to represent the average when the data is not symmetrical. It is one of the measures of central tendency, but if the data is not symmetrical, one is advised to use me median. It is basically defined as a point in which half of the values are above and half of the value are below. For example, this, this, this is the distribution of the data. The, the, the curve is not obviously not symmetrically distributed and you have a median, which means half of the value, value are on this side and half of the value are on this side. So this is the proper and uh, proper and correct use of median. Mode, mode is not that frequently used in medical research. Uh, it is defined as the most frequently occurring event and it is used to describe categorical variable when this uh, you know yes no answer male or female or etiology of some disease in those kind of thing you can use me or sometimes it is used in in neuro in neurosurgery or clinical literature when the disease and disease uh, disease uh, occurrence is more frequent at certain particular age group for example in craniopharyngioma there is a bimodal distribution. One it is more frequent in adolescent and uh, another peak is in middle age. So this is the only use of mode in neurosurgical literature. Let's go to the slightly difficult part of statistics, the term standard deviation. It is also very commonly used. It is quoted in more than 50% of the mainstream papers. So we have to know what it means. And it is used as a basis of a number of statistical calculation. These are the two reasons why we should be knowing what standard deviation means. Again, standard deviation is used only when the data is normally distributed. If it is not normally distributed data, standard deviation is not used. It indicates how much the data is spread around the mean, how far they have gone around the mean value. If we say that, Somebody, the, if the age of the patient, mean age of the patient in my po patient population is 50 years, standard deviation will show how far they have gone. Again, good news is here. We, it is not necessary for us as neurosurgeons to know how to calculate it, but it is a must for us to interpret what it means. Let's give an example of this beautiful curve. This is a perfectly symmetrical bell shaped curve. Remember in bell separate call, all mean, median, and mode will, will be the same value. So this is the mean. So this is the standard deviation. So the tail falls sharply and equally on each side. By, this is by customary, uh, customarily, one standard deviation will capture 68.3% of the data. If somebody says, I'll use two standard deviation, then that will capture 95.5% of the data. If somebody uses three standard deviation, then they, that will capture almost 100%, 99.7% of the data. So in the result section, when we see the, uh, we read the article, they would typically describe as mean age of the patient was this plus minus one standard deviation. Means they have included 68.3% of the data in that mean age. Let's, let's get, get an example, uh, let's have an example here. A group of patients enrolling for a trial had a normal distribution of weight, normal distribution for weight. 
the mean weight was 80 gram, 80 kilogram. For this group, the, they have already calculated the standard deviation to be five million, five gram. Let's interpret this data. So if they have given in bracket one standard deviation, if somebody, if they don't write one or two or three, it automatically means one standard deviation. They have included 68.3% 60, of the participant will weigh between 75 to 85 uh, uh, kilogram because you, de you deduct five uh, kilogram from 80 and you add five kilogram from um, with, uh, to 80, it will raise from 75 to 80, 85 kilograms. Now, if somebody includes two standard deviation, they would include 95.5% uh, of the participant, but the range will go up, see? Now it will go from 70 to 90 kg. If somebody is very ambitious and wants to include three standard deviation, they will include 99.7% of the participant, but the range will be more. Now they have to decrease it, you know, from 80 minus 1565, 80 plus 1595. This is exactly how the standard deviation is interpreted. Let's go to the research hypothesis. This is also very fundamental and most important part of any research. Uh, any research. This is the bedrock of evidence-based medicine. Research hypothesis is a specific, clear, and testable proposition about the possible outcome of a scientific study. And it describes in com concrete term, remember when we use the term as hypothetical, it means in a vague term, but in terms, in terms of research, the hypothesis is, uh, should be described in concrete terms, what you expect will happen in a certain circumstance. And all research hypotheses should be proposed at the beginning of the data collection, not when you already collect the data and then you put the research hypothesis. It is, usually, it is used in a clinical study to define the relationship between two variables. Usually one, one variable will be independent variable and one variable will be dependent variable. And if the classical way of describing all hypotheses is we don't want to be committed before and we all know that there is a difference between sun and moon but in terms of stating a hypothesis, we say that there is no difference between sun and moon. That is called null hypothesis. There is no difference between the current treatment and the proposed new treatment. That will be the null hypothesis. And the alternate hypothesis written as S1 in bracket will be the hypothesis the researchers wants to prove, but they will not write it initially. And all the research hypothesis should always be preceded by a research question. This is actually the beginning of any research. You should have a research question in mind, then you formulate research hypothesis, and then you go into collecting data. Let's talk about these two very important uh, terminologies used in statistics, uh, which, which will test the confidence. One is confidence interval, another is p-value. Confidence interval is also very commonly used in new uh, literatures. More than three fourths of the mainstream journals will use confidence interval in their original article result, uh, result uh, section. So we should be knowing it is nothing but a range or interval in which we can be fairly confident where the tree value lies if we had access to the whole population. I would explain it in a slightly different way. If we had the access to the entire population, then the entire populations of, uh, of true value will be there. So confident interval basically says, how confident are we that our result taken from that sample is close to the actual population if we had access to the actual population. This is what confidence interval is. Also, this is usually customarily put at 95% con uh, confidence level. So if some say confidence interval CI is this, uh, extends from this to the, this to this with 95% confidence level, it means that if you do the repeated research from that same population, you take multiple times, in 95% of the time, your value will truly represent the population value. This is what 95% confidence level means. Here is the catch. The size of the confidence interval is related to the sample size. If you have a large sample size, the researcher will be so confident that, the, that they will put a narrow confidence interval. If you have a smaller sample size, smaller studies, 
they will put a wide confidence interval because they will not be certain. Another term which is closely associated with confidence interval is the margin of error. It's, uh, it's described in the previous couple of slides. The, there is a population where we are interested in to do the research, but we do not, it's impossible to do the research on the entire population. So what we do is we take a sample from that population and we do the research on this population and we come with the results. And what we do is we, re, we want to generalize the result of that sample back to the population. But during, during that process, invariably there will be some error uh, during that process, which is called a margin of error. It is up to the researcher how much margin of error is acceptable. See, we, I uh, presented in the previous slide that in statistics, we can never be 100% sure. We can always come to the wrong conclusion, but it is up to you how much margin of error. Like you want to put 2%, you want to put 5%, it is up to the researcher with some solid reason. So margin of error is, uh, uh, it is this. Let's go to the another most commonly used terminology called probability value. As shown in the three star, it is very commonly used. More than 80% of the paper use the term p value. It gives the probability of any observed difference having happened by chance. Suppose if we have done a beautiful study, what is the actual chance of having that outcome because of your, uh, your treatment? or it could have just happened by chance. We'll have a few examples to describe this in detail. This is what uh, p-value means. Again, good news is here. As neurosurgeon, it is not important for us to know how the p-value is derived. We need to know what that p-value means. So let's interpret the p-value. If p is 0 0.5, the probability of the difference having happened between two groups by chance is 0 0.5 in one. 50-50, not good. In the modern medicine, anything which is 50-50 is just like tossing a coin. It is not uh, acceptable, so it is not significant. So if somebody says p-value is less than 0 0.05, here is the explanation. The probability of the difference having happened by chance is 0 0.05. That means 0 0.05 in one, that, or one in 20. So good enough, 99 out of 20%, it has the difference has happened because of your intervention. So this is just customary thing. Everybody, statistician, medical researcher, everybody decided that let's keep this p-value at 0 0.05 to be significant. So anything less than 0 0.05 is considered as significant and anything above 0 0.05 is not considered significant. Let's go down to further. If somebody calculates the difference to, uh, uh, p value is less than 0 .0 0 0.01. This, this could have happened one in 100 times. So it is called highly significant. Somebody calculates p value as 0 0.001. The chances of that person being correct is 990 out of 1000. So this is considered as a very highly significant. So if you have a big, la larger sample size, your chances of having very highly significant outcome is higher compared to if you have a small sample size. Let's get with this example. There were 376 new patients in neurosurgery OPD. They were randomly assigned to be seen by Dr. Jones and Dr. E. Smith. I have taken this example from the book I showed earlier. This is what the result, initial result was. Dr. Jones saw 200 patients. Dr. E. Smith saw 176 patients. And in, the, in terms of patient satisfaction, 93% 93 of the patients were satisfied with Dr. Jones and 95% of the patients were satisfied with Dr. Smith. Uh, but in terms of consultation time, Dr. Jones on the average takes 16 minutes to see one patient and Dr. Smith finishes the patient in six minutes. And here is the standard deviation I just discussed. So this is, standard deviation is 3.1 year, 2.8 year, fairly close. So just looking at this, we cannot say which doctor is better. In terms of satisfaction, they seem to be okay, but in terms of seeing the patient fast, Dr. Smith sees the patient faster. But unless we do the statistical test, we cannot be sure. Let's apply the statistical test and now we see the p-value. So in the first case, 0 0.144, and in the second, in terms of patient satisfaction, 
0.001. Let's do the inner. So obviously in this case, the, the, the patients uh, who are seen by Dr. Uh, Smith um, are satisfied equally, but Dr. Smith sees patient much faster. So you will be liked by his director, hospital director and his senior uh, because he sees the patient fast with the same degree of uh, patient satisfaction. There is another closely uh, related term called statistical versus clinical significance. Okay, something comes very statistically significant, but, uh, but whether that has some clinical value or not, we as clinicians should, should be careful about this. I will give one example. Somebody uh, probably said, uh, produced uh, a very novel drug which reduces the blood pressure. Suppose somebody has a blood pressure of 180, this novel medication decrease the blood pressure by five millimeter of mercury, decrease it to 175 millimeter of mercury. And he put the uh, did a statistical test and p-value was significant. But is it clinically significant? Obviously not. We want some medication which will decrease your blood pressure below to 140. So even if it is statistically significant, it may not be clinically significant to us. So sometimes, you know, statisticians play with the data and uh, come out with a p-value. This is what we say as don't torture the p-value. Even if it doesn't come out significant, it is okay. Still, we have done proper literature. And even if it is not significant, it will add certain amount of input to the existing body of literature. This is what torturing of the p-value is all about. Now let's go to the statistic which test the differences. Again, first, they are broadly divided into two groups. One is parametric, another is non-parametric. Parametrics are, parametric tests are used only in normally distributed data. So it is so important to differentiate your data at the outset. Parametric tests commonly used are the t-test, also called student's t-test, Fisher's exact test, and chi spur test. Non-parametric tests, which are commonly used, are man with u test and kruskal wallis test. It is impossible to go through all the tests, but I briefly touch a couple of these tests here. Let's describe a student's t-test. There's a very interesting history about uh, this test. This is important. Uh, it is quoted in more than 40% of the journal. So we need to know what this test means. This, uh, this was devised by William Saley Gossett, who, who was working as a, in a brewery company in England in, Scotland, Ireland, I think, in the Guinness uh, uh, brewery. And he divides the T-test as an economical way to monitor the quality of the beer. So the contribution of alcohol in the literature. And uh, as per the policy of the brewery company, no employer was allowed to publish any, any article on, uh, with their own name. So he used the pen name as student uh, and published the paper. Hence the name student, and later, only later his original real name was revealed. This test again is applied only in normally distributed data, as I said earlier, and it is used to compare the means of two sets of data. You have a two sets of data, you want to compare the means, and you want to see whether these two means are different or not, you apply the student's t test beautifully. Let's get that same example we, uh, we saw again. So this was the result. And we did the, then this was uh, the thing. First, we had the null hypothesis. There is no difference between Dr. Jones and Dr. Smith in terms of patient satisfaction and in terms of who sees the patient faster. Then we applied the T-test and now we found that P-value is 0 0.4 and uh, in, in terms of consultation time, P-value is 0 0.001. So conclusion in terms of satisfaction at this. It is likely that the null hypothesis is correct in terms of patient satisfaction. So there is no problem with Dr. Jones and Dr. Smith. But in terms of how, how fast somebody sees, we reject the null hypothesis and conclude that Dr. Jones sees patient much significantly faster compared to Dr. Smith. This is the appropriate way of applying students' t test. Let's go to the chi square test. Again, it is used in more than 40% of the paper. We need to know this. It determines if two categorical variable, here is the difference, you know. In the t-test, you compare the two means from two sets of data. Whereas in chi-square test, 
to determine if two categorical variables are related or not. And it basically makes the use of contingency table. The example is will be the current example of, you know, what is the actual risk of a healthcare worker who are taking care of the COVID patient and the risk of them catch, catching COVID-19. You make disease and no disease, exposed and not exposed, and how many of them actually end up being uh, getting the disease and how many those not exposed also end up getting the disease and you do the chi-square test and you come up with the value. And then you can say that, okay, working in the hospital is a statistically has a statistically significant higher risk of catching COVID compared to working in a bank or something. We can do those kind of uh, uh, research and apply chi-square test. Fisher's exact test was formulated by, was uh, first described by Ronald Fisher, also a famous interesting experiment. This is used when the sample size is, uh, sample size is small. If you have a larger sample size, chi-square test is better. There was a, there was a, you know, there, it started with the serendipity. There, there was a lady who said that uh, putting a sewer bef uh, milk before the tea, the tea is uh, better compared to if you put milk before sugar. And he actually did uh, this test that which, uh, which uh, tea is uh, taste better if you put sugar, if you put tea first or you put, you put milk first. And based on that interesting conversation with the lady, he came up with this test, which is called Figus, uh, Fisher's exact test. This is typically used when more than 20% of the cells in the table have expected frequencies less than five. And uh, this is called exact test because it gives all the time, it gives exact p-value. It doesn't say less than, it, uh, less than this value, it gives exact p-value. That's why it is called this. Now let's go to the man with me you test. It is, uh, it is fairly used, uh, fairly commonly used, but not as common as chi square or student's t test. It is again, it is a non-parametric test used to compare two sample means and calculate the p-value. This is the equivalent of the t test of parametric data. So the use is exactly same, but if your data is non-parametric, we use man with new test. It is used when the data is ordinal. For example, if you have a, this kind of data, uh, one, two, three, four, five ordinal, like Glasgow outcome scale or or you know, modified ranking scale, you use man with me, you test when the data is ordinal. Now let's go to the statistics which compare risk. The most of the time it is the risk ratio or relative risk or the odds ratio. The difference between risk ratio and odd ratio is this. Risk ratio or relative risk is used in cohort study, whereas odds ratio is way used in case control study. I think for, for, the, for us, if we know this much, the majority of the time we can find out which type of test to be used. The statistics which analyze relationships are basically correlation and regression. Correlation and regression measure the strength of association between two, two variables. For example, what is the risk of a negative outcome in patients with head injury? If we compare the age of the patient and the outcome, then either with a progressively increasing age, the outcome, Glasgow outcome is still maybe progressively on the negative side. So in those kind of situation, correlation and regression should be used. It could be either positive or negative correlation. And uh, this is important, which, which, uh, which thing you come out with. Uh, the correlation coefficient is the one that is used. Pearson co correlation coefficient is used for normally distributed data, whereas Spearman a correlation coefficient is used for non-normally distributed data. Now to analyze the last few slides, to analyze the survival, survival analysis is nothing but the analysis of the elapsed time. The commonly used two methodologies are like tables and Kaplan-Meier plots and Cox regression model. Kaplan-Meier plot, I think everybody is very familiar with this plot. It basically says with one event, it shows the end point is uh, how many patients are still alive at the end of some defined time. For example, this Kaplan-Meier survival plot was uh, used for a cohort of patients with, who were diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis at the end of 20 years. 
slightly less at the end of 20 years, slightly less than 40%, 36% of the patients were still alive. This is what the Kaplan-Meier plot, plot gives. If you want to compare the survival between two groups of patients, you can still use the Kaplan-Meier curve. This curve was uh, again the same rheumatoid arthritis patient, but they were comparing men and women. The men, women have the solid line, men have the dotted line. See, at the end of 10 years, at the, at the end of 20 years, significantly more men die compared to female. So, but Okay, we cannot say significant. It seems, I would say it seems like that, but we use a test which is called log rank test. And if the p-value, again, our beautiful p-value is less than 0 0.05, we can say with confidence that the survival bet uh, between men and women is statistically different and women survive longer. So statistics which analyze clinical investigation and screening are very important also. The terminology which are used here are sensitivity, specificity, and positive and negative predictive values. And then finally, you calculate the area under the receiver operative characteristic and characteristics curve. And you come up with the conclusion that which test is uh, how, how diagnostically accurate. And the, the, the one which is commonly going on for the last five, six months is what is the accuracy of the RT-PCR or what is the accuracy of the rapid diagnostic antibody test for COVID-19. And when we read the literature, the scientists have actually used this sensitivity, specificity, and all these predictive values when they come up with the conclusion that our test is 70% accurate, 80% accurate, or 90% accurate based on this thing. So to conclude my presentation, we have a data we do the statistical analysis, and then we come up with the useful information in the medical field and that we apply in the day-to-day -day care of our patients. And again, in the day-to-day -day care of our patient, again, we generate data. That data will be again statistically tested, again, more useful information will be gathered. And this cycle will repeat time and time again for the better care of our patients. I'd like to conclude with this uh, uh, quotation from Dr. A.G. Wells a century back. Statistical thinking will one day be as necessary for efficient citizenship as the ability to read and write. Due to this corona crisis, our travel has come to an absolute standstill. Hope one day I will have the opportunity to welcome you all to my country, whether it is for the conference or for trekking. Thank you so much for your patient attention. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. It was a wonderful presentation, I must say. I would like to invite Professor Kajita to say his comments first. Professor Kajita. Yeah, thank you for your excellent lecture. Yes, yeah, statistics is, seem to be difficult, but you explained in a way that uh, easy to understand. Yeah, statistics is very important to understand the data properly and uh, uh, successful research work. So actually, it's a young neurosurgeon is very busy for clinical work. But I believe that your lecture encourage the young neurosurgeons to have a uh, academic mind and do research work. Yeah, thank you for your lecture once more. Dr. Liu? Uh, thank, thank you for a nice presentation. Yeah, I just wanted to get your opinion because uh, recent years, uh, people was looking at the value of P, P value. Yeah. And another group of people are looking at the big data. Uh, yeah. And what's your opinion uh, with the, the relevance of uh, doing RCT with the P value and also looking at the big data? A any comment? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And very nice, uh, very nice question. Yeah, if you have access to the big data, it is okay. But you know, in the real time clinical situation, access to the big, big data is really difficult. Access, like in terms of COVID, maybe we could get big data because there are, you know, more than 100,000, 200,000 patients with the COVID. But if you want to do some research on head injury or, you know, subarachnoid hemorrhage or, you know, spinal cord injury, Getting big data will be difficult. In those situations, we need to get sufficient number of patients and apply the p-value. 
P value is not a magic value. You know, if the P value doesn't come out, comes 0.06, it is hopeless. And if it comes out 0.04, it is celebration. No, it is not like that. It's so arbitrary thing. It just shows the trend. You know, if if your research says P value borderline significant, that suggests that you have to go to a bigger sample size, or if you have an option to go to the big data. That's my opinion. Right. Thank you, Prof. Thank you. Thank you, Liu, for asking. Thank you for clarification, Prof. Sharma. Uh, Dr. Vinu V. Gopal is among us. Dr. Vinu, Vinu is an uh, associate professor in Government Medical College, Kottam. He's very much into research. Yes, Dr. Okay. Vinu. Vinu, your mic is muted. Can you unmute your mic, Vinu? Hello, good evening, all. Yeah, yeah. yeah Vinu. Really? Thank you, sir, for the excellent presentation. You have touched upon the basics of statistics. Uh, one uh, question to you. What is the feasibility of uh, doing interventional studies in neurosurgery? There are uh, actually, uh, my answer will be yes also, my answer will be no also. The reason is, yes is if we do not do who will, and especially in the low and the middle income, we should be the one doing it. And it is possible with some constraint, especially multi, multi centric, we can do because one center alone will not be able to generate enough number of uh, patients to have a properly randomized trial. If we do multi centric, we can. The catch is to conduct a properly randomized interventional study is very expensive. You have to have a data management board, you have to have a, you know, all these, you know, things. Uh, to be fulfilled before you can conduct the study. But in a smaller scale, still we can do it. With not much harm to the patient, still we can do it. Uh, yeah. Sir, in Nepal, uh, how is that? Uh, the, the, what is the procedure behind uh, randomized control trials? Yeah, how one, you... yeah, the way we do is the person, the researcher who wants to do the randomized control trial should have a certificate of good clinical practice. The person mm -hmm. must have passed that test. Then it should be approved by the National and Nepal Health Research Council Ethical Committee, uh, Ethical Review Board. That goes through our institutional uh, review board. And then once they approve, you can start recruiting the patient. But the, in the event of some bad outcome, they have to report the, that, uh, uh, that bad outcome to the data board in the Central uh, Nepal Health Research Council. Uh, it can be fairly done in a smaller scale though. Oh, but we should yeah. push it, Dr. Vino. We should push it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. We should have a good backup also from the institution. Yes, we need to have a good backup. And uh, your, both your seniors and juniors should support. Otherwise, only one person interested, it doesn't go forward. That's the. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. yes. And that is very Thank true. You. Thank you, Dr. Thank Vino, for your comments. As you say, drug trials are always very difficult to come through, especially in India because of the side effects and also because if uh, the claims, insurance claims that come along with it. Most of these trials are insured beforehand. Yeah. So uh, because of that reason, the Institutional Review Board is rightly, is a bit skeptical about drug trials. One of our resident, the second resident, he's currently working in Maldives. That trial was use of drain after drainage of chronic subdural hematoma. So one group uh, we used drain, and one group we did not use drain post-operative. That was back in 2013-14. So it was a miniature form of actual trial. Right. Uh, so, yeah. So and the outcome was drain was not useful. Okay. <laughs> Everybody is skeptical. Everybody wants yeah. to put the train for safety yeah, reasons. Um, yeah, that's... We will wind up the session now. Uh, Professor Sharma, you have given an excellent talk and uh, I'll have to go back and uh, rewind and see and uh, too much information to get into my small minds. So I have to relax, rewind and see what uh, actually the different... Uh, studies and the relevance of each test you mentioned. It was very informative. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Professor Kajita, thank you for much, so much for coming here and chatting this session.
on behalf of the cns education committee and professor yoko kato i thank both the speaker and the chair for this excellent presentation thank you very much all the audience thank you lu my co-host who took his time to come over here so then it's all bye bye take care bye -bye.